Okay, so why don't we, uh, why don't we get going? Uh, so of course, uh, any any time a, a graduate student uh, finishes up a program successfully, it's uh, it's typically a, a bittersweet kind of uh, experience. Um, bitter, of course, because uh, someone who's grown to be um, a valued colleague is sort of leaving the nest, and uh, we don't have their day-to-day -day, uh, company. Um, and sweet, of course, because they've been successful, and so we, we usually have a blending of those two kind of emotions. Um, today we have uh, the exit seminar of uh, Francis Sivakov, and unusually, it's not the typical mix of emotions. Um, why? Because Francis actually left us a, about a year ago, a little bit over a year ago, um, to go to North Carolina where she, where her husband had a postdoc position, um, so she's been doing all of her analysis and the final stages of her writing there. So we were sort of weaned of Francis about a year ago. We got through all the bitter stuff. And so today we have only the sweetness of <laughs> That's nice. So Francis is going to give her exit seminar in the ecology graduate group. Um, and let's see, so a few other things. Um, of course, we all know that uh, it's always a happy day than when the, the program is successfully completed. You know, any PhD thesis is always a challenge. It's always, uh, there are always all kinds of uh, difficulties that are uh, encountered. Um, uh, for some people, there's an unusually large number of hurdles, different kinds of hurdles. And you just pray when you start a project that you won't be one of those people. <laughs> but if you choose to study long distance dispersal, as Francis did, you can be guaranteed that you indeed will be one of those people. So Francis uh, managed to uh, overcome all of the obstacles. Some of them were really challenging conceptual problems that uh, she encountered. Some of them were just the normal sort of what you can expect if you're studying dispersal, like the really difficult logistical um, challenges, and managed to come, overcome all of those. Um, and I'm really proud of what you accomplished and uh, all the things that you learned. So, um, so here's her talk. Uh, pest management uh, from a landscape perspective, understanding the factors that influence the distribution of light assessments. Take it over. Um, maybe, should we turn off the lights yes. here? Yes. Okay. Um, Sources. This has been huge, as most of you know, for 
getting my research done. Uh, and then uh, special thanks to my, my thesis committee, uh, former member uh, Richard Plant, and then current members Neil Williams and Marcel Holyoke. You guys uh, have always believed in me and kind of uh, had confidence in my skills as a scientist, even when I sometimes didn't. So I really appreciate that. Thank you. Uh, thanks to my collaborators. You'll hear about them a little bit more during the talk, James Hagler and Eve Carrier. Uh, thanks to my friends, uh, uh, both here at UC Davis and um, back east in, in Maryland. Uh, thanks for keeping me sane, I guess. And to my family um, for uh, letting me take this five-year vacation, as we called it, to California from the East Coast. It wasn't always easy, but it was worth it. And, and finally, thanks to my uh, husband, David, who unfortunately couldn't be here today. He's teaching probability, but um, he's uh, really been a big supporter of me uh, for it all along. Thank you. And last but not least, thank you to my advisor, Jay. Um, Jay doesn't have a lot of silly pictures uh, lying around for a good fodder for exit seminars, but uh, I do have him uh, helping out in the field. Um, I was always, uh, one of the comments that Jay made that really stuck with me was uh, that working, doing my field work was the hardest uh, he's ever worked in the field. And uh, that always was like, wow, I really am crazy for doing this project. <laughs> but uh, thank you, Jay. And Jay, I will miss your Jay-isms, but I hope that, and I know that they have uh, stuck with me and really taught me a lot. So, and now on to the beach of the talk. Um, I was interested when coming to grad school to ask biologically basic questions that were interesting to a wide variety of scientists in applied settings. This is something that Jay does really well, so I chose to work in annual cropping systems. Um, annual cropping systems are ephemeral habitats, and they're um, ephemeral both spatially and temporally, as opposed to something like a perennial uh, cropping system, which is like an orchard or a forest. And it's not easy to be an insect in, a, in an annual cropping system. Um, your habitat can be there one day and not be here there the next day because of harvesting, um, pesticide applications, uh, the tillage of soil can affect, you know, uh, where you overwinter, uh, irrigation, and also host plant variety if you perhaps like a, a BT modified plant. Makes, takes it kind of out of your uh, realm. But um, these high risks and uncertainties associated with living in these types of systems can be reduced by certain pest characteristics. Um, pests can be polyphagous, and what I mean by that is feeding on uh, more than one type of uh, plant or um, weed in the agroecosystem. And uh, plants, the insects can also be mobile. So um, polyphagy, what polyphagy does then is it allows the insects in the system to feed, have a lot more choices of what they're feeding on, especially when sometimes they're not there. Uh, and then mobility allows insects to access uh, the landscape on a larger scale. So resources um, that are distributed amongst the landscape can, can uh, then be accessible. So. Um, I'd like to argue in, in this talk that to effectively study the distribution and dynamics of insects um, that are successful in these systems, we have to step away from thinking of uh, agricultural systems like this, uh, kind of on a local field-based uh, level, and instead think about them on a larger scale, something like this. Uh, maybe not quite as large as what you see outside of a an airplane window, but this view has always inspired me and kind of maybe makes me why I like to think about uh, agriculture so big. Um, and these ideas aren't uh, new. Uh, a lot of the ideas of my uh, research comes from this paper by Kennedy and Storer. And in this paper, they argue that um, to really understand polyphagous pests in agriculture and understand their distribution and abundance, uh, we need to think about four things. Uh, first, the characteristics of the subject population, and this includes their dispersal ability. Second, factors 
associated with the surrounding landscape. Also, um, harmful agents. Um, this, I think what they mean here are like predators, but it could also be like uh, pesticides if you think about it abstractly. And also uh, the abiotic environment. So in this talk, uh, we're going to consider mostly uh, number one and two, but also we're going to talk about predators a little bit as well. Um, so first, um, the first part of my talk is going to be talking about dispersal of dispersability not only of the pest, but also of its predators. And typically, dispersal ability is studied um, using mark release or capture experiments. And in these experiments, a um, focal population is either collected from the field and brought into the lab, or is raised in the lab. And in the lab, they're marked uh, with some kind of uh, marker, and then brought back into the field and released at a focal point. Um, after this release, uh, populations are recaptured at several known distances away. And then you can kind of describe this dispersal ability based on uh, the amount, the number recaptured and the distances. But there are a couple of difficulties with this method that have ultimately resulted in dispersal being something that's very hard to study and done on a very small scale. First you're limited by the number of individuals that you can mark. And what this does is it then, in turn, limits the number that you can release and reduces the likelihood of recapturing marked individuals. So as a result, um, these studies are often only done on a very small scale where you actually have a decent chance of recapturing marked individuals. Um, they can also alter the behavior of the insects by this whole rigmarole of collecting and marking and releasing, so that's challenging as well. And also there's this idea of the area dilution effect, which means that as things spread out from a central point, the likelihood of recapturing them decreases. So all of these things uh, have resulted in um, dispersal being very difficult to study and um, not done very often. And as Infrequently as dispersal is studied, the relative dispersal ability of predators to their prey is done even less. Um, uh, while it's not really done very much empirically, there are a lot of theories about predator movement re relative to prey movement. And one of our untested assumptions is that prey outdisperse their predators. And this is an idea that was presented um, in, in Huffaker's uh, original paper, uh, who's incidentally my uh, academic great-grandfather, which is cool. Uh, and what the idea is is that the predator-prey interaction was able to stabilize because the prey outdispersed the predators. And when the predators cut up, they decimated the populations. But there was always still prey in the system because they were able to outdisperse. And while um, this has kind of been thought a lot about uh, theoretically and modeled, it hasn't been looked at empirically, which is um, kind of a shame or surprising because uh, it has been shown both in theor uh, theoretically and empirically that the early colonization of natural enemies is a key feature in the suppression of, of pest populations. So this is obviously a, a big interest and concern to entomologists and, and bio biological control specialists. Um, so, what we do is, in the first part of the talk, what I'll discuss is um, a large-scale mark capture experiment that we did um, where we were able to describe both uh, the dispersal of the predator, I mean the pest, and its pre predators. And we were able to do this using um, protein marking. And I'll describe a protein marking. Um, and then I'll take a short detour and, and talk about an improvement to the analysis of uh, protein marking data, which will, was able to extend its application um, from small scale studies to larger scale studies, and which was essential for analyzing my data. Um, the second part of the talk, we'll talk about the effect of landscape on um, the prey, I mean, sorry, focal insect or pest populations and dynamics. And 
traditionally, the relationship between landscape structure and um, sort of the population dynamics of a focal insect have been studied using uh, correlated methods with uh, focal patch studies. And what that does is relates uh, some feature of the population, like its density, to some description of the landscape. Um, but these are very um, sort of high, they require a lot of effort to, to get this kind of data. So there's often a trade off between the size of the data set and um, the sampling effort needed to answer these, use, use these kind of methods and answer this type of question. So as a result, most studies are modest in size. And what this does is, while you can ask more pointed questions, like how does crop type X affect the focal density, you don't, it doesn't allow for a real exploration of what's going on in the landscape. And so, and that's because these small data sets uh, impose limits on statistical power. So in the second part of my talk, I'm going to describe um, our work to correlate the densities of a focal uh, of, a, of a pest in a focal population with uh, the presence of a wide variety sweep of, of habitat types. And I do that using a pre-existing survey data set. And this allows us, and I'll describe what that is, but it basically allows us to have a lot more statistical power because of the very large size of the data set. And so, um, we asked these questions um, with the focus of Lygus hesperus, um, the western tarnished plant bug. And this is a, a generalist functional herbivore that has over 100 uh, species of plants, uh, feeds on 100 species of plants and 24 families. And when I say functional herbivore, what I mean is uh, like most um, true bugs, Lygus is actually an omnivore. Um, but in California, at least, we've really only seen it um, act like an herbivore, so functionally, or for our purposes, that's what it is. Um, and it, in, it's had a uh, long and rich history of study uh, in the UC system, including UC Davis, and a lot of its the effort has been um, and focused on cotton, and because it's a major pest in cotton. And in terms of its dispersal ability, uh, I was interested in why is because it's kind of been studied on a small scale and gotten one answer that Lygus doesn't move very far. And then on a larger scale in the correlative study, it, the um, uh, Lygus has been uh, thought to move from up to 1,500 meters away. So the potential to move very far, but actually mark recapture wise, it's only been shown to go uh, very short distance. Um, Lygus is interesting because while it's a major pest in cotton, it describes, uh, it, it displays a preference for other s common hosts in the agroecosystem, and including alfalfa. And like I said before, it has a long, rich history of study and here, and here are a couple of the, the uh, kind of key players in, in, in Lygus history, and uh, the history of Lygus research. And what's interesting is, cultural controls have been developed because um, because of this strange thing that the vulnerable crop is not the preferred crop. So um, techniques have been proposed uh, like intercropping, interplanting where alfalfa, a preferred host, is interplanted with, with cotton to hope that all of the ligus will just move into that alfalfa and stay out of the cotton. And the other idea is this uh, thing called strip cutting where you have an alfalfa field, and the grower harvests only in strips so that the uh, ligus that are currently in the alfalfa field will be displaced, but they'll be able to move it right into some more uh, delicious alfalfa. So one other observation that I noted was that uh, to really be successful in this field, you had to have a V in your name. <laughs> so I decided to do a little modification and uh, I made Jay a real success, but don't worry, I'm already covered. Nice. Now we're good to go. All right, so like I said, uh, this is kind of 
from our long history of study of, of Ligus with a, the yearly kind of colonization cycle, as we know it kind of looks like this, and I decided to depict it in a, in a hokey cartoon. So at the beginning of the growing season and overwintering, uh, Ligus are thought to be in weedy field margins and perhaps in the um, weeds in the foothills surrounding the San Joaquin Valley. And when those dry down, Ligus are thought to move into early season crops like alfalfa. So like here, the blue is going to represent alfalfa. They're going to be really happy because they've got a really high quality host and build up large populations. But alfalfa is harvested every 30 days or so for hay, uh, hay alfalfa. And this causes the environment to go from a perfectly lovely one day to inhospitable and uh, prompts a uh, dispersal event. And the insects can then move into surrounding fields often which are uh, vulnerable cotton. And it's this movement that we decided to study in our large-scale dispersal study. So some scientists um, put their merit on how many papers they get or their citations. And at least for this study, um, I wanted to, I really kind of valued how many large pieces of equipment I could use in, in this experiment. <laughs> so this experiment's also known as, you want to put what on my fields? <laughs> So, like I mentioned before, I, we decided to use protein marking as our, our marker type. And um, how it works is a protein mark is uh, detected using protein-specific antibodies in an ELISA, an enzyme-linked immunosorbent assay. Uh, the mark is applied externally as a spray or internally in the insect's diet can be used for things like um, predator gut assays, but it's not what I used it for. And insects pick up the mark by either getting sprayed directly or walking on sprayed plant material. Uh, it has several key advantages that kind of overcome the traditional problems with dispersal studies. Um, specifically, insects can be marked directly in the field. Um, marks are easily obtained and inexpensive, and um, it, the ELISA technique is simple and, and rapid and cheap. Um, so when things are marked directly in the field, you can mark a huge source population. Uh, I did this experiment three times, and the sizes of the marked area ranged from 14 acres to 72 acres. So imagine the uh, insect population in, in that marked area that was sprayed. So um, there are three types of common food protein marks that are currently in use, um, the first of which is milk, the second of which is eggs, which I also use, and then the third is soy, which we do not use. Um, and when I say cheap and inexpensive, uh, I mean that I can get a whole lot of it very easily. Um, this is Jay staring inquisitively at the pallet of milk that I've had getting loaded into my truck to take down to the field. Um, also loaded by a giant forklift, which might count as a large piece of equipment number one, if you're, if you're keeping track. Um, okay, so here's what I did. I, once I had my protein loaded, I was ready to go. I loaded it into my truck, thanks to UC Davis here for allowing me to rent the largest truck possible with a normal person license. It even made a beep beep noise when I backed up and I was petrified, but it was awesome. And um, then came the best 15 minutes of every field season when the crop duster that I hired sprayed the protein onto the, the alfalfa field. And fortunately for you, I have video of it. See the airplane, hopefully you can see going over my alfalfa field. So that's awesome. And then, just because you haven't had enough. Yes. Alright, this actually really gets the the uh, importance of spraying accurately, which was important for me because I only wanted my alfalfa field sprayed, and it's important for the crop duster because he doesn't want to spray chemicals if he's spraying chemicals for somebody else on somebody else's field. So that really kind of nicely shows this cutoff and that I was sure that the alfalfa field was actually being sprayed. Um, so because I really like large pieces of field equipment, 
Uh, I did this experiment three times, like I said, and the first year that I did it might have had the coolest uh, experimental setup. It was sprayed using a helicopter. And then to load the protein onto the helicopter, you landed on a giant tr tanker truck. Uh, to look. And I, I kind of want to say thank you or maybe shake my fist at Jay for not letting me go up in the, in the helicopter with the, I don't think it would have been allowed, but he's like, don't even think about it. <laughs> so uh, after the field was sprayed, the grower cut it, after, and um, this prompted a dispersal event. And then we uh, sampled insects in surrounding cotton fields. Um, uh, and we did this at known distances. Uh, you can see all of the field work that I had, for field workers I had up here. And thank you again. It was a huge, huge effort. It's ridiculously hard. Um, we were basically carrying around 10 pound leaf blowers that were shaking as we were doing it and walking for miles. So it was, it was exciting. Um, and sampling was repeated on multiple time points. Um, so I show one of my um, field maps down here. And um, I just show this to say that we did this for three years and the scale of each year was different. So um, the results aren't directly comparable. That's just for future. And here's a little video of, of what it looks like us sampling. Just because I had it. Let's see, I've got like back protection, ear protection. So samples were sorted, identified, and tested for protein. And some of the insects, here's the insects we collected with what we had were um, different expectations for dispersal ability. We have lace wings and lady beetles, which are, aren't really thought to be important predators of lagus, but are known to have very high dispersal ability. And then we've got geoparis and anabis, which are known to be predators of lagus, but uh, their dispersal ability was unknown. Um, so now we're going to take a short break before getting to the results and say that at this point I had this data and I couldn't really analyze it until I kind of fixed this issue with um, the uh, protein marking, uh, the analysis of protein marking data. And so that's why it comes at, at this point in the talk. Um, and what this did was really extend the uh, application of the this uh, technique to larger scale studies. So, and the outcome of an ELISA is an optical density score. And basically it's on a 96 well plate, and the darker um, the color in each well, the more protein detected. So you'll get insects that have a score like this, and a score like this, and you're like, what does this mean? And what you have to do is, because it's a continuous score, you have to set a cutoff or a threshold. And when you do that, if the scores for actually marked individuals and actually unmarked individuals are separate enough, the distribution, then setting a threshold would be easy. And everything that was classified as marked would be correctly classified as marked, and those would be true positives. Uh, opposite of that would be true negatives, unmarked individuals. But what commonly occurs is that these distributions overlap. And this results in classification errors. And how those are classified are actually unmarked, I mean, actually marked individuals, excuse me, that are incorrectly classified as unmarked. And those are false negatives. And the opposite, and what I would argue as the more problematic, when unmarked individuals are misclassified as marked, false positives. So um, where you set a threshold is purely dependent on the experimenter and depends on the amount of error that you can, or the type of error that you can tolerate. So for instance, if you have a medical test and a score of white blood cells that misclassifies or, or yeah, that, mis that classifies someone as sick or healthy, if you've got a uh, if the cost of retesting people or calling them, misdiagnosing them as sick is not very high, but the problem of misidentifying uh, an actually sick person as healthy and, you know, may perhaps dire consequences they could die, you always want to be on the safe side and have your false negative rate be lower. Um, 
alternatively, and what I'd like to argue is that false positives are a big problem when you're trying to study long distance dispersal. And I try and show that here. If your true positive population actually looks something like this, and this would kind of be a nice description of the dispersal, when you add false positives, the, 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 the shape of the dispersal curve then shifts to something like this. And where the big problem is, is in the tail of the distribution. And the tail of the distribution is actually what you want to know about when you're studying long distance dispersal, where a fatter tail seems would indicate that the population was spreading faster. So um, what we identified in our work was that false positives are actually uh, more common than would be expected. Um, traditionally, this False positive rate is set by, by taking the mean of the negative controls or unmarked individuals on a plate and adding three times the standard deviation. And what that does is actually generates a false positive rate that's about an order of magnitude higher than would be expected. You'd expect one in a thousand false positives, but what you actually get is 10. Um, second, this false positive rate is masked. So while you actually, well, so it's a little complicated and I'll describe it happily to you afterwards if you'd like to do it, but essentially you don't actually ever detect false positives amongst your negative controls. But so a researcher is misled into thinking that they have no false positives when they could actually have very many. And the third problem is that this false positive rate is exaggerated and the problem is exaggerated when you have not normal data. So very quickly what we found was that instead of at the expected rate of having one in a thousand false positives, what we were actually finding was 44 in a thousand false positives. And when you're only collecting, uh, and when you're only interested in that like one in a million or one in a, a needle in a haystack chance out at long distances, this is actually an unacceptably high rate. So very quickly what we did was we, um, the reason why the false positive rate was so high was a poor estimate of the standard deviation. So we transformed um, things using a standard normal variant transformation. And I'll be happy to answer questions about that later, uh, which basically puts things, uh, takes away um, differences between plates. We used a different sort of uh, weight calculated a threshold based on the other seven values of the eight negative controls to unmask any false positives. And we used a threshold that didn't depend on the shape of the distribution. So what resulted was instead of a 44 in a thousand case, we reduced that to about two and a half in a thousand false positives, which is a much more reasonable level. And the number of actually marked individuals that were correctly marked, were correctly identified as marked, did not vary very much very much. Okay, so I just kind of show that here. And what's exciting, I'm just going to skip ahead a little bit, what, but what's exciting is that these methods that I kind of just described are already in use. Um, some of you might remember uh, Dominic Reisig, he just graduated. He's um, studying uh, the movement of stink bugs um, and his, he's using ELISA to protein marking to identify that movement. And he's uh, he said that my methods have kind of improved his confidence in this in his movement. So I think that's really cool. So uh, diversion over, and we're going to move back to uh, the results of the long distance dispersal study. Just to remind you, uh, relative dispersal of, of predators and, and pests. And so now with actually uh, a high degree of confidence that the marked individuals that I collected were actually marked, um, we were able to ask is, are there differing dispersal abilities between species? So you're going to see a couple of graphs that look like this. We're going to have the distance traveled on the y-axis and then the individual species on the left. And um, it's a box plot, so the average uh, uncor uncorrected mean distance flown is marked by this little x. And what we found when we use a, a randomization test was that ligus dispersal appears to fall in between that of its predators. We found that uh, lady beetles tend to not move as far as ligus, 
while the lace wings and, and navis tend to go further uh, than lagus. So this is, is very different from the untested assumption that prey outdisperse uh, their predators. Um, so what I kind of want to just show here very quickly is that we then corrected the estimate for mean distance flown based on the area of the uh, annulus of the ring that we sampled and the number of samples that we took. And um, you don't remember the, no need to remember the distances on the previous graph, but essentially the rank order is, is still the same, but the mean distance flown estimate is, is higher uh, once we correct because we put more weight on marked individuals that are, are captured farther uh, away. Uh, we did this also, like I mentioned, in the two previous years, but as uh, one might expect when studying uh, a particular insect, uh, you go out trying to find like, one thing, like lagus, and then you don't find it. But we, have, do, we do have, for other, the other two years, uh, information about some of the predators. In the 2006 data, um, the scale is much smaller, uh, only 1,200 meters or so, but um, we did find that Geocorus and Hippodania moved about the same. Uh, and then in 2007, we went out very, very far, and uh, not surprisingly found that Geocorus went further. So that, that explains why we can't really compare between years. And, um, and that Navis uh, also tended to not go too far, but then we had one outlier that went very, very far. So uh, overall, we couldn't find a difference between the species. So summarizing this first part, um, harvest triggered long distance dispersal event does not appear to result in Ligus populations that out disperse uh, its complex of predators. And so the idea that Ligus is not under good biological control because its predators can't keep up with it is, is something that's just not the case here. So it kind of leads us to ask, uh, what, what would be an effective predator for, for Ligus? Uh, so I'd like to argue that it's not just a predator's dispersal ability, but also it's a trophic strategy. And what I mean, I kind of try to show here. Uh, if you've got a specialist predator, an effective predator would be one that goes about as far as it, as it could. Because if it out dis if um, the prey outdisperse the predator, then they're going to escape control and populations are going to explode. Um, but if the opposite happens, the predator is going to starve because it doesn't have any food. Um, so things might be better. A better type of predator in this case might be a generalist predator, even if it out disperses its prey items. It, it, it can feed on alternate prey, uh, waiting for the target prey to catch up. And even better still might be an omnivore, <laughs> where um, a newly colonized patch uh, where that might not have any insects in it yet, uh, a predator, like an omnivore, can feed on plant material. So um, for the rest of the talk, I'm going to discuss a uh, landscape kind of study where we uh, looked at the effect of particular crop types on ligus density and focal confidence. So recall that ligus use a variety of habitat types over the course of the year, and they show preferences amongst those habitat types. Um, and, and what I like to show in this schematic here is that habitat can have a, a variety of effects on uh, insect population dynamics and distribution. So we've got the vulnerable crop here in yellow. It might be cotton, it could be whatever. And then this is the effect of crop X. If crop X is a high quality host, um, it could be a source of individuals. Uh, the, the population in that, sor in that habitat could have a higher birth rate, the death rate, and could um, export individuals uh, if that field is harvested. Uh, alternatively, it could attract individuals, kind of be like a trap crop of sorts, um, taking individuals away from the vulnerable crop. If it's a low quality host, um, this is the idea almost like a sink where the uh, population dynamics of death rate is, is higher than birth rate. Um, or the crop X could have no um, obvious effect on population growth rate, but it instead could uh, reduce apparency of the vulnerable crop. The uh, insects couldn't find, maybe wouldn't find the vulnerable crop as well, 
or it could be a conduit of dispersal. And what I tried to show here is like maybe uh, it, bugs in the, in the landscape move normally through that, but crop X is such that it really kind of filters individuals towards the, the vulnerable crop. Um, we have certain assumptions uh, based on the past history of Ligus research. Uh, we know that safflower is a uh, very uh, desirable, high quality host for Ligus. So we expect that as the area of safflower increases in the landscape, that the density of Ligus in focal cotton fields will also increase. Um, uh, and similarly for weeds, um, this is something I mentioned that uh, Ligus prefer weeds and often are, are present on weeds early in the season and then move off into uh, vulnerable cotton later. So that's the idea that more weeds in the in the landscape, more Ligus in focal cotton. Alfalfa is one where we saw from my large-scale dispersal study that a harvest event can really trigger movement into surrounding cotton, so perhaps that relationship is positive. But there's also evidence in the literature that more alfalfa in the landscape kind of could attract ligus away from uh, cotton and, and perhaps reduce their density in focal cotton fields. So um, we also have evidence from an earlier study, uh, Carrier, who is, who is my collaborator, that um, cotton, presence of cotton in the landscape could reduce ligus densities in other focal cotton fields. So what we did was we were interested in a suite of 16 habitat types, which are listed here. That's really the only important information on this slide. And we we're able to uh, evaluate their relationships to ligus density in focal cotton fields. Um, primarily because of our large, uh, uh, our large pre-existing survey data set. It had a lot of power because it was very, very large. And what we did was we um, used insect scouting data generated by private pest management consultants. And they took sweep samples of uh, focal cotton fields to kind of get an idea of what the density of lights was to give recommendations to their growers about the spring. But what does this data do? It like sits in files unused until we come and uh, kind of take it and put it in this very large data set. We estimate ligus density um, based on these sweep counts. And we did this for the early part of the, of the cotton growing season. We were interested in um, sort of colonization cotton, so early cotton. And we didn't want confounding effects based on pesticide which are usually start spraying sometime in July. So we also had landscape scale data for Kern County uh, in the southern San Joaquin Valley. What we did was we uh, were able to identify our uh, ranches and our focal cotton sites that we also had the, the ligus density information for. And then put uh, kind of like three kilometer buffers around each of these uh, focal fields. So um, very quickly what we did was we had a focal cotton field that we had the density information for and we put um, concentric rings up to three kilometers away surrounding each field. We then identified mm, the 16 crop types. I've only got three highlighted here. We've got green and cotton, uh, blue alfalfa, yellow uh, uncultivated ag, so the weak stuff. And then we measured the amount of area in each of those rings. <coughs> and essentially what we had then is we were interested in a correlation where our dependent variable was the uh, ligus density. And our independent variable was the amount of a particular crop type in a ring. And while you see 12 rings here, we actually only did it on a three ring scale. The analysis just worked out much simpler. So it was 1,000 meters, 2,000 meters, and 3,000 meters was the furthest away. So that's what I was trying to say with the area. This is just a little bit of minutia. I'm kind of just going to skip it, but we got correlations for each of the six years of data that we had, and then we performed a meta analysis to get the overall effect of a particular crop type on line density. What we found was that five of the crops were um, had a 
overall positive effect on ligase density. So their presence in the landscape generally meant that ligase densities were higher in focal cotton fields. We also identified five crops that were generally negatively associated with ligase densities. And then we uh, found six crops that were kind of neutral to, to ligase density. Here's what it looked like overall. And so we had a couple of not surprising results. I think I mentioned them earlier. We've got found that safflower was positively correlated. Uncultivated ag, the weedy kind of fallow fields, those were also positively. Onion is a known host of lagus, so that was not surprising. And then negatively correlated was alfalfa, which I showed previously um, could have been positive or negative. We actually found a, a strong negative of correlation. And then cotton, which is something we had expected. And surprising results, which is really interesting because this is something that people who think about lagus every day as a, for a living don't really consider these crops when they try and think about their management. Um, grapes uh, came out as positive. And this is uh, likely because of weedy field margins, or I, I can think of that it's weedy field margins or in between rows. It might be the host, actual host for lagus. And then oats, which haven't um, been identified as a host for lagus, but um, the wild type uh, has been, the sister species uh, has been identified for lagus. And um, it's one of these hosts that dries down, kind of like safflower does, early in the growing season when lagus is just starting to be vulnerable. So this movement out of oats, as the host suitability declines, might be the reason why it is uh, positively correlated with lagus densities. Um, similarly, we found that almond and pistachio were negatively correlated. Neither almond nor pistachio are thought to be hosts of lagus. So it's likely that um, this might be a uh, Parency effect, maybe they just can't get through those fields. Um, that's kind of unclear. And then potato is negatively correlated. And this might be a result of grower practices um, of spraying potato before harvesting. So pesticides might be an interfering factor here. So um, lastly, we use this information to give a couple of suggestions for the design of agricultural landscape. First, we suggest avoid planting vulnerable crops uh, near habitats that are positively correlated with pest density. So in our case, that would be like avoiding planting safflower next to uh, cotton fields. Second, um, we suggest planting vulnerable crops near habitats that are negatively correlated with pest density. So maybe using them as traps. So perhaps planting net cotton next to properly managed alfalfa might be a, a good suggestion. And finally, if vulnerable crops are themselves negatively correlated with pest density, like cotton is, we suggest that clustering those vulnerable crops might be a technique to protect against lagus damage. So this is a summary that I kind of talked about already. But generally, if we take it back to our bigger question, um, we did say that a lot of the landscape really does matter in terms of uh, understanding lagus population dynamics and density. And we showed in our first part that lagus are highly mobile, can use the landscape effectively. And so in closing, I guess I'd like to encourage really the importance of landscape uh, skill management for, for lagus. With that, I'd be happy to take any questions.
so after the cutting, how, how soon after we, we sample, we wanted to let things distribute and settle a little bit, but not to go too long. Um, the protein generally lasts up to about two weeks. So um, we kind of just tried to do a time point that was immediately, kind of like one day after um, cutting. And then we tried uh, to do equally spaced time points afterwards. So we ended up doing in our most successful year, the, the 2008 year, we did one day after cutting, and then three days after cutting, and then five days after cutting. So at two weeks, it wouldn't be effective. Generally, the mark, um, so my collaborator, James Hagler, has done a lot of like checking, essentially, and, and what he's found is that the detection rate of marked individuals declines uh, over time, but probably is, is less than 60% um, or so after about two weeks. Thanks. Sure. Yeah. So, uh, I, I just love the technology and I like people to think big, so I think this was great. Um, in terms of agriculture versus invasion biology, people are, are interested, I think, in different parts of that um, dispersal distribution. And invasion biologists are interested in the way far tail. And I think the way far tail is important if you're worried about the lightest initiating new populations, but it might be that something like the mode, you know, how far do most of them go, is going to be more important uh, for agriculture if you're worried about these sudden in inundations. So have you played around with that a bit? I've definitely thought about that. Um, it's interesting because cotton is one of these crops that just a little, just, um, low number of individuals identified, uh, like detected can be really devastating to the crop. So it, it is more of a uh, kind of a low number issue with that crop. Uh, also, it's interesting because if you get a great influx or like the mode, and people just spray, like no problem. And I, you know, I'm, I'm kind of more curious on that gray zone, what happens? At, like when things are a little bit rare. Thank you. Um, so when you were looking through last little part that you talked about, you were talking about pest densities for those that large data set. Mm -hmm. Were they different um, over the course of those two or three years that you looked at? And was that correlated at all with the amount of alfalfa the amount of alfalfa growing in that particular year or some of those other crops that you question. So, okay, what that would be um, is, I actually had six years of data, and um, you would expect that if uh, the, the correlations would be a little bit different if um, uh, across the years. Um, we did see differences, and so that's why we're interested in looking at the overall uh, effect of a particular crop. Um, Sometimes those correlations could be strong, sometimes they could be weaker, sometimes they could appear significant, sometimes not. And so what we were interested in is in general. So yeah, there's a lot of variability between them. I, I guess I'm just sort of wondering, like, I think this would be hard to implement at a landscape scale, but if you could um, encourage uh, farm management practices at a landscape scale, I could see, you know, using the ideas from the study that recommend planting all the one year and then, you know, oh, so on a year-to-year year basis. Cycle, just based on That's so not just pumping solution, but also pumping. Huh. That, that is a very good idea. And I had not really thought about that, but I know you think about that. So I think we have another class coming in at once. So I think we unfortunately need to skedaddle, but let's uh, take a